welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. This is the screwdriver sharp I made for Emma's spare room machine shop tool making competition. The competition video itself is based on the fiction that my Lego minifigures make grouped together to make it for themselves, to use like a segue. The video is mainly intended to be fun and doesn't go much into how the tool was actually made. As I have all the machining footage I thought I'd make this follow up in a more regular style explaining how the tool works and the more important points of how it was machined. The tool works by clamping a screwdriver in the central hole like this. The blade has to be twisted until it's parallel with the central shaft and then the angle is adjusted by the amount the screwdriver extends to the end. The wheels then allow the blade to be sharpened on a conventional oil stone like this. The reversibility makes sure that the opposite sides of the blade are perfectly parallel. The construction is fairly simple. The two concentric parts of the shaft are held together by this retaining screw which also keeps them in alignment in this slot. The two parts are pushed apart by this spring in the middle. I used two springs because the springs I have are very weak and I needed a bit more strength to hold the screwdriver firmly. And these two holes line up to hold the screwdriver in place using that force. Each part has a wheel on a bearing pressed on the end and held in place by the interference fit. All the parts are made from silver steel because the competition specified the single piece of stock. If I was going to make this again without the competition rules I would use various different diameters that the parts use rather than turning down from a single diameter. I've re-edited the machining footage to try and more sh clearly show the various steps. During the machining I was very focused on making an entertaining video so not all the detail is captured well. Let's take a look. I marked out three pieces from 20mm silver steel bar stock, one for each of the shaft sections and one to cut the wheels from. In each case I cut the stock 15mm oversized to allow the part to be held in the chuck and then parted off. It's best to avoid rechucking parts between operations so I chose an order of operations which allowed me to do as much as possible in this initial setup. The first part is the outer central shaft, so it needs to be turned down, then drilled and bored to make the chamber for the spring and to accept the inner shaft section. This small lathe can only cut a maximum of 0.2mm deep, so turning the outer diameter to, took a lot of passes, most of which weren't filled. I used a large radius insert and ran the lathe RPM as fast as possible. At around 1800 RPM it was still way slower than the insert's rated cutting speed of 450 meters per minute. The final few passes were much shallower. I do this because deep cuts have high cutting forces which causes the part to flex and means the resulting diameter has a slight taper. Light cuts up to the final dimension keep the taper to a minimum. Drilling and boring is where I made my first big mistake. I chose the initial drill size to be the tap drill size for an M5 thread so I could use an M5 screw to hold the wheel securely on the other end of the shaft. However instead of the correct 4.5mm twist drill I used a 5.5mm twist drill. The inner diameter of the wheel bearing is 6mm so this leaves no room at all for the thread. I didn't notice at this point that I had drilled the wrong size. 
I enlarged the hole with a 7.5mm twist drill before using a reamer to bring it out to 8mm, the final dimension. The stringy chips getting tangled around the minifigure was an accident that could have gone badly, but fortunately gave me the opportunity to make my favourite part of the competition video. The bottom of the hole needed to be flat to provide a firm seat for the spring, so off camera I used an 8mm counterwall cutter to flatten out the shape left by the drill profile. With the outer diameter and bore complete, it was time to part off and flip the part around to machine the wheel bearing surface. This is where I discovered the mistake with the tap hole size. Fortunately, this provided another opportunity for some fun interaction between the characters in the competition video, and I made this brass plug press fit into the hole. I hadn't yet finalised the plan for how to secure the wheel on the end, but I hoped I had options. This is my first attempt at machining an interference fit. I did some digging online, and roughly estimated that 0.01mm oversize should work. I pressed the plug in off camera, and it seems to have worked out fine. As I wasn't yet certain what to do to fit the bearing to the first part, I got on with working on the second part. The outer diameter of this bar had to be turned down to 8mm, even smaller than the first. Silver steel is cheap, but this still feels wasteful to me, especially the amount of machining time it took. As before, I skipped most of the external turning, and the technique was the same as before. This part didn't need boring, and the bearing could have been mounted on either end. I decided to part it off before machining the surface for the bearing, so I could do those operations as close as possible to the chuck. It's much easier to make precise cuts close to the chuck, as there was way less flexing and chatter. It's also much easier to avoid machining a taper. I switched to a small radius insert for the bearing mount, so it was easier to make sure the inside corner was tight enough to seat the bearing secured. I used the wheel scales to measure the 6mm length of cut here. It's crude, but it seems to work well enough on the box on lathe. I searched online for the tolerances required for a press fit, and learned that it is highly dependent on the specific bearing. The manufacturer should provide data on the correct tolerances to use without damaging the bearing. The bearings I planned to use were incredibly cheap and came with no data and no branding information. I looked at the data for other manufacturers and with no real idea what I was doing I settled on 0.01mm oversize. I cut a 0.5mm relief behind the bearing, leaving a 0.5mm seat for the inner ace of the bearing. I tested the fit off camera, and it seemed like a reasonable press fit to me, so I started working on the second bearing mount. Here you can see the brass plug pressed in to repair the oversized hole. To spot and drill the holes, I used an edge finder to locate the back jaw, and then the wheel scales to move to the centre of the shaft parts. The toolmaker's vise has a horizontal V-groove halfway up the movable jaw, which makes it surprisingly easy to hold small cylindrical parts securely. 
cut the retaining screw hole and slot, I switched to this V-block and clamp that I bought specially. The two shaft parts were held in alignment using the shank of the 4mm twist drill that was used to drill them. The first twist drill was the tap drill size for the retaining screw thread. I drilled into both parts, stopping just short of the diameter of the inner shaft. When tapping it's easier and safer to have a through hole, but I couldn't think of a way to make one without damaging the inner diameter of the outer part. The second twist drill was 4mm, the same size planned for the retaining slot. This was a mistake as the drill wandered a bit and left an oversized mess. I should have drilled undersize and then brought it to final dimension when milling the slot. I drilled this hole very slightly into the inner part to allow the retaining screw to have a firm seat. I then used this end mill to flatten the seat and make sure the retaining screw wasn't likely to break loose. I used my shop made tap follower in the spindle to cut the thread, first with the starter tap, then with the bottoming tap to make sure I had enough turns. I removed the inner part before using a carbide end mill to mill the short slot. At this point it became obvious how messy and oversized the starter hole was. The only way to tidy up the slot would have been to make it around a millimetre wider, but that would have made the movement of the tool much sloppier and possibly harder to use. The slot plays a vital role in keeping the clamping holes aligned. The final parts to machine were the wheels. At this point I'd given up on using a screw to hold them, and had settled on pressing the bearings in and relying on that to keep the wheels in place. The silver steel stock is ground on the outer diameter, so I didn't do any outer diameter turning. I drilled the stock out to 10mm, then used a boring bar to cut the bearing seat. The wheels are 1.5mm thicker than the bearing, so this leaves a 1.5mm wall for the bearings to sit against. I cut the inner diameter 0.01mm undersize. I really have no idea whether this was right, but the press fit seems fine and the bearings don't appear to be damaged. Once again I cut a 0.5mm relief into the wall to ensure the outer race of the bearing was in contact and the rest could run free. I used the wheel scales to measure the right width before parting. A digital readout for this lathe would be great, but very hard to fit on something so small. For really precise measurements I use a long travel indicator, but it's fiddly to set up, and feels unnecessary when the final dimension isn't critical. Parting the wheel off was nice and easy, largely because the 10mm centre hole made the cut quite shallow. I used an old end mill shank to catch the part and avoid any damage from falling into the chips. The second wheel was exactly the same, so I made it off camera. The machining was now all done, so it was time to fit the parts together. This was my first attempt to press a bearing on and it seemed to go fine. I don't have a real press so a vice had to do. This was a ridiculously clumsy way to press it the rest of the way, as the nut wasn't exerting any force at all on the inner race. I should have machined a press ring the right size to seat it safely. In my defence I was running up really close to the competition deadline and I had very little idea how this should have been done. The same applies here. The bearings don't seem to be damaged, but I'm pretty sure that's just luck, and the lateral press force shouldn't be going through the bearings like this. Final assembly was simply a case of putting the spring in between the two parts, pressing them together and fitting the retaining screw. <laughs> 
In this clip, the spring isn't actually installed because I had to do the assembly without my hands in chop for the comp competition video, and I couldn't find a way to press against the spring's force. The end result is a solid, useful tool that works really well. Watchmaker screwdrivers often get chipped or gnarled up, and being able to quickly neaten them up will be invaluable. The competition win and camera gear I got as a prize is going to really help me improve this channel too.